This is the Collaboration Dynamics Podcast, helping you work together better with Judy Reese, X-ray listener, best-selling author, international virtual collaboration trainer, and master of metaphor. Hear more at xraylistening.com. And welcome to the Collaboration Dynamics podcast. With me today is Julian Wilson. Hello, Julian. Hi, Judy. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Absolutely excellent to have you here. Before we get going, I suppose the first thing to do is to invite you to introduce yourself. Who are you? What are you up to? And what 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 are you up to in relation to collaboration? Well, as you say, Judy, my name is Julian Wilson, and I'm the uh... I'm the director of a company called Matt Black Systems. And what's interesting about what we do is we have developed a self-managing organization. We've developed that over probably the last 15 years. And it's been quite an adventure of change and exploration around how to organize a conventional business in a rather unconventional way. How do we collaborate? How do I collaborate with people? It's a really good question. In many different ways, I guess, is my answer to that. So, which ones are you interested in, (laughs) Judy? Oh, there's so much to ask you about there. Um, Now, you and I have been uh, talking several times over the recent weeks because of your your, uh, ownership of the the self-managed, self-managing organization, which is a subject that absolutely fascinates me. Um, so I suppose the reason I invited you on the podcast was to find out about how collaboration works in that context. So in the specific context of a business where I think you said that, uh, the members of your team are in cells of one person. They're almost independent contractors within, within a larger organization. Yes, almost independent. They're the normal employed people. It's just that we don't form them into teams. So we form them into teams of one. Mm -hmm. And then from that point forward, they collaborate together. I suppose, really, if I had to capture the essence of how we collaborate, in just the same way as we -hmm. collaborate voluntarily in our home life, we try to work out a way of doing that at work. So let's imagine you voluntarily collaborate with the accounts department. How could that be in an organization, in a business? Well, it's quite possible if you view the accountant as a subcontractor. You can choose any accountant. Mm. And then you voluntarily contract with them to do do the work. Absolutely. Um, At that point, the dynamic between the collaborators kind of shifts a lot. There's no power dynamic between them. It's very much more customer-supplier relationship um, in the same way that you don't feel powerless against your your electricity company because you can always swap. Mm-hmm. And I, I suppose when you de- defunctionize an organization and remove the hierarchy, that's what you're really removing, the forced collaborations, the collaborations we have no choices about. Mm-hmm. And those are often the most dysfunctional ones. And the ones we find most claustrophobic and unpleasant, really. Mm-hmm. They say, don't they? You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. And that kind of is the same at work, but worse. Mm. You can choose your the people you hang out with, but you can't choose the people you're forced to work in with the team. Mm. So in Matt Black Systems, people have the same freedom they would have with friends. Indeed, yes, yes. Um, it's a little. Remember, it's a business, so mm-hmm. it's a little bit like there's a goal in mind. So let's imagine that in we were in business together. Judy had a goal of of I don't know, catering for a party, mm-hmm. and you're going to be paid for it. And you said, Julian, can you come along and, and, and drive the van for me? Now. I may see the collaboration as partly about economics, partly because I want to work with you, partly because I know um, I've got a van and I need I need to use it because I've got to pay for it. 
some kind of thing, well, there's an opportunity here for me, but also I'm going to help you out. And so there's it, the collaboration takes place on many different levels, mm-hmm. not just the economic one. It's also the one that, you know, I want to work with you, Judy, because you're a good fella. Mm-hmm. So when the collaboration is like that, like um, working with friends, and a lot of people say you shouldn't mix business with friendship because of that very complexity of the multiple levels. So there's the economics, there's the economics, there's the personal benefit, there's the, uh, you know, wanting to help someone out, all of those mixed together. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um... I don't think it's a terribly simple situation. I, I, I think it's easy for a, a personal differences to, to come to the fore and, and misunderstandings to take place. That's very true. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't dismiss that in a, in a more friendly collaboration. But on the other hand, with the the disciplines of of work, with the shared goals, it's not so bad. Uh, People certainly are willing to overlook difficulties and and, and um, disharmony when somebody's clearly rescued them from a very difficult situation. So let me try to be more specific about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's easy. In our old organisation, before we changed, people used to be very careful what they said. It was very politically correct. It was very, in some ways, like treading on eggshells all the time when they were negotiating, talking to each other. And they'd often talk about things which were very benign. Mm -hmm. They they weren't controversial. They weren't pressing any of these buttons. They weren't difficult conversations. As we changed to self-managing organizations, uh, self-managing organization, where people were far more focused on the outcome they were trying to achieve, Mm. their expectations on each other rose. And we went through a period where, honestly, they didn't collaborate terribly well because they'd rather do things themselves because they didn't feel they they could trust other people to support them. Mm. As them. As they collaborated more, the core team started to appear who were very much focused on, um, my colleague here is certainly very dependable, I can, he's earned my trust and I want to work with him because together we're stronger than we are as individuals. Mm-hmm. At that point, the conversations really got a lot tougher, a lot more straight, a lot less emotive and they would talk about important things and often would seem to be almost rowing, mm-hmm. but without ever getting personal. Curious thing to watch, somebody, two people who were clearly having a, a engaged exploration about a subject that, that's clearly raising their passion but whilst at the same time remaining completely you know, at ease with each, with each other in the conversation. Does that make sense? It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a very curious thing to watch. It seems a very mature thing to watch um, because they, they, the argument didn't turn in on themselves. It always was focused on the subject in hand. Mm-hmm. So that was interesting. Uh, as the as people became more dependent upon each other, they became quite a lot more tough in their conversations. Paradoxically, in our old organization, I think people weren't very dependent on each other and were keeping each other at arm's length, almost, mm-hmm. because they were forced to collaborate. So when they're you having know, these tougher conversations, almost rowing, yeah. and engaged like that, um, how do you know that they're not actually rowing? That's a great question, Judy. How do you know they're not actually rowing? First of all, the conversation revolves in orbits around the thing, Mm -hmm. like a planet orbiting around the sun. It orbits around the difficulties they they face together. It doesn't start... They don't start orbiting around each other. You said Mm. this, you did that. It always remains focused on, I don't understand why this didn't work, what happened, why didn't it work when you did this, that didn't work, why didn't it work and the conversation never shifts its focus from the thing they're discussing even though when the other person might have done something which is in error or by mistake 
but they could see that either one had made, would have made that mistake and it was something about the thing they don't really understand. They're trying to unpick it, unpick it and niggle at it rather than it being, well, you must have done it wrong. Mm-hmm. So the conversation switched from the thing to you did it wrong. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? There's a, yeah. there's a subtle shift of blame almost gone on to the person that somehow they must be responsible for the mistake. Absolutely. I'm thinking about some some work that my colleague Caitlin Walker has done in which she maps the uh, com- the the, mo- the movement of information in meetings and she draws a diagram in which the thing sits in the middle of a circle representing all the people in the meeting. Yes. And she has these star-shaped meetings where a lot of the attention goes on the thing rather than on the people in the circle. Yes. And it, it sounds quite a similar structure so, to what you're describing, except you're describing with just two people. Yes. Well, of course, there can be several people in a, in a meeting who are discussing a, something about a, a tricky situation. Let's imagine that um, something's got broken at work and they're having a discussion about what to do about this. And really, the, the focus remains around the thing, getting it sorted, getting it up and running again, preventing the problem occurring again. Not who broke it, who's responsible, who's naughty. Mm-hmm. And if only we found out who it was, then we could blame them and it wouldn't happen again. Mm-hmm. So the, the, that would be a, an argument, really, mm-hmm. looking for blame. There's a, I, I tend to witness far more of this focus on, right, this is a problem. How can we sort it? How can we prevent it happening again? And honestly, anybody could have broken it. Mm-hmm. We all could have broken it. Mm-hmm. So that's, in, that's, um, that's definitely the litmus, litmus test I would use. Great. So to go back from the members of your organisation, back to you, because you were the instigator of this change, as I understand it. So I'm very curious about you, you personally in relation to collaboration. So when you are collaborating at your best... Hmm. That's like what? I think that depends on what I'm collaborating about, Judy. Mm-hmm. If if I'm collaborating on a task, if we've got a specific goal uh, which directs the task, then it would feel very much like I'm I'm pulling my weight, I'm contributing the thing that I'm offering. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm doing what I said I'd do. There's there's that. That's a hard-working contribution. Mm -hmm. Um, Pulling pulling your weight. Yes, that's a good one. Um, If the the collaboration was more about finding a solution, taking a decision, something like that, Mm -hmm. that's a bit different because we're, we're, we're now juggling different perspectives and we're trying to come up with the right conclusion. What is mm-hmm. the right thing to do now? And of course, now there's that question of pulling your weight is quite the right thing to do because you really want to find the solution rather than just end up with my solution. Because mm-hmm. the weight in the conversation, your weight in the conversation may be different to how good your idea is. Mm-hmm. So I'm, as an industrial designer, I'm perfectly uh, used to the fact that some of my best ideas have been rubbish. <laughs> now, I, and I rest assured that rather than going to ask somebody else, well, how should I do this? How should I fix this problem? It's much better for me to make a quick and dirty prototype and let reality test it. Mm-hmm. Because reality is a much tougher taskmaster than, than either I will be on myself or indeed um, a colleague will be. So if I make something and it doesn't work, you know, reality doesn't seem to care if it upsets me. Mm-hmm. So I'm stuck with it. I'm left with that face in the face of I didn't know my solution wasn't good enough. So I think when, when I'm collaborating with colleagues looking for a decision on something, as, a, as an engineer, I'm really keen to stay in the not knowing. That's how I collaborate, I suppose, at my best. Mm-hmm. Stay in the not knowing and, and tease out from anybody 
and everybody, every little bit of information we possibly think could possibly influence our decision. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like we just collect, I call it collecting dots. I think of those pointillist paintings or, um, do you know, there's, an ex there's a test you can do to see if you're colorblind. It's mm -hmm. not a series of dots, slightly different colors. And if you're not colorblind, you can see the numbers hidden in the dots. Yeah. And if you are colorblind, you can't see the numbers. Um, so, so I just call to check, it, you're collecting dots. That's right. So we're collecting, collecting pieces of information. You put, oh, you know this, let's put that there. And this other right place, I'm not sure, but, you know, it looks like it should go there. And this other piece of information. And this piece is context that we hadn't really thought about. Now, that's quite important. Oh, and there's some customer feedback. Yeah, we'll put that there. And eventually, when all these dots are lying on the floor in front of everybody, it becomes very clear what the pattern is. Mm -hmm. Some people see it easier than others, but often it's very clear. Mm, so you're collecting dots, and when they're all on the floor, and then it becomes clear. Yes. So rather than trying to trying to come up with a solution in our heads or come up with a, a preferred dream of what these dots should be like, just collect them. Mm -hmm. and, and staying in the not knowing, staying in the the void of, of really yearning to conclude forcing yourself to stay in that not knowing is, is critical when you're decision making. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you've made the decision already, haven't you? Yeah. So how do you know when you've collected enough dots? Um, because the the um, there's no loop of interpretation when you look at these things. So let's mm -hmm. imagine in one of those um, colour blindness tests mm -hmm. you've collected half the dots. And I'll let you into a secret. The answer is eight. But mm. you've collected half the dots, and it looks really like a three. Mm. Now, you could say, wow, it's a three, isn't it? We've got all the dots we need, and we've determined it's a three. Mm. And there's a tendency, of course, to, to find another dot and say, oh, yeah, this is a bit of customer feedback. Yeah, they don't like blue things. And you say, oh, it doesn't really fit in my three. It fits over here. Hmm. See, that's probably an, a, a rogue piece of information, probably an error. That's an outlier. Let's ignore mm. that. In fact, that outlier is, is screaming to you that this might be a nine or even an eight. But you think it's a three because that's the leap you've made. So mm. what we do is we exhaustively, even to the point of, of boredom, keep collecting the dots until we're absolutely sure that we've nailed every possibility. And now the obvious solution is so obvious. And I have to say, it's really tricky mm. because most people love to conclude. Yeah, I, I can I really get this. So absolutely, most people love to conclude. Yeah. And you're doing exhaustively to the point of boredom, collecting dots. And staying in the not knowing. Mm -hmm. Staying in the not knowing. And when yep. you're doing that... What happens so, so, to so, your weight? Um, what happens to my weight then, it doesn't doesn't have any great um, impact mm -hmm. on the solution at all. So your weight when doesn't it, impact the solution. Does your weight have any influence on the collecting yeah, for, of the dots? Yes. Because the best thing I can use in my weight is to constantly say to people, I'm not sure that we, we know everything we need to know about this puzzle. Mm -hmm. So I can use my weight in a meeting to say, let's keep exploring, let's keep exploring. And, and people who are really, really keen, you know, that's that, that's that moment, isn't it? You flick a coin in the air, you catch it, and you slam it down the back of your hand, and everybody waits, don't they, to see, mm -hmm. is it heads or is it tails? And holding people in that moment people find exasperating. Mm. We don't know yet. Let's keep looking at the information. Yeah, we can't, yeah I think it's definitely tails. So let's go with that. Can't somebody just make a decision? You know, mm. I'm, I'm so, I just want to conclude. Surely we don't have to keep going through this, this, um, this effort. I remember going to a customer and doing some product design live in front of a customer, in front of a customer and large customer many different departments and because I broke this unwritten rule to say that says never do design in front of customers 
several of them participated in the activity. And quickly we got to the point where we didn't know the answer to some technical issues. And they still, well, I'll get my colleague in from the EMC department. He can come over and we can talk about that. Well, in the end, there was 12 people from their organization in the room that afternoon, all of whom were had their little piece to add to the to the design we were exploring. Mm -hmm. At the end of the meeting, we came up with a super simple solution to the problem. Super simple. And everyone was really pleased with, with it. And it was a sales meeting, and they paid me 1,500 quid for really just hosting them, exploring. And the 1,500 quid was tiny compared to how much it cost them to, to organize 12 you know, mem senior members of their staff to get together in this one meeting room. Mm -hmm. But the solution saved them hundreds of thousands. Mm. And it would have been easy at any point to say, do you know, we'll implement this complicated and difficult solution rather than stand and not knowing and keep pulling in more expertise. So that's the, that's the sort of thing that I do when I collaborate at my best in solution finding. That's, I use my weight to hold the meeting open, mm -hmm. hold the exploration open, or hold the, the, the discovery process open. Mm. So that's uh, when I collaborate my best in task, it's pulling my weight. When, I, and when I'm exploring and solution finding and deciding, then I use my weight to hold the, the meeting open to create a void, if you like, where where the solution can kind of collate. It can kind of, I don't know the word I'm looking for, it's something like it can kind of form in the puddle. You know, I'm, I'm holding mm -hmm. the depression in which the puddle can form, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it sounds... So, so I'm so, kind of expecting the world to fill the depression to make the puddle rather than mm -hmm. me putting something into it. So you're creating the depression in which the puddle can form. Yeah. So it's 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 a void rather than sorry a void rather than a void. Um, it, it's yeah. it's not a space or a floor so much as a void, a depression. Yeah. And and things then have a natural tendency to fill it. Yeah, and people will contribute their bit. And when it's when everybody's contributed their bit, usually the solution becomes really obvious. Mm -hmm. um, that's the that's the beauty of it. It's usually at some point somebody puts in a piece of information and go, aha that kind of has, has changed the direction and understanding of this problem completely and now we see it with a different perspective. Now if we arrange rearrange these dots it's so clearly it's an eight. Mm. These outliers here, they weren't things that we were it's kind to ignore. Actually they're important parts of an eight. Now, we can predict if we look over here, there should be another dot. So we go and look over, oh yeah, look, there was another dot. We'd missed that one too, because we weren't expecting to see one there. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, yeah, yeah, look, this is, this is obvious, this is an eight. This is an eight, yeah, and, and the, the, the organization, the, the team gets a lot more sense that they've discovered the solution together rather than they've been told it. Now, can I cheat and squeeze in one more question, which okay. is, so when that's how you do it, you're collecting the dots, you're holding that depression for the puddle to fill, all of that, and is there a relationship between that and the kind of tougher conversations that the members of your organization now have? Is there a relationship between that? Certainly the conversation becomes very focused on the thing mm -hmm. and the dots. See, when we contribute uh, our pers perspective to a problem, we reveal, we reveal something about our inner world. Mm. So if I could glimpse into the way I, our, our mind works. And, when, and that's quite, for some people, that's quite anxiety-provoking. Mm. It's like a, a, a poet who writes a poem and you think, oof. He's crazy, isn't he? Whenever we, whenever we express our 
innermost perspective. It's a very revealing and exposing practice. So when people focus on the dots as opposed to the person, it's a very freeing perspective because they're not looking into you, they're just looking at the idea you had and, and you came up come up with another idea, another idea, another piece of information. And people see these things as gifts. We could look at it like this, we could look at it like that, rather than revealing what's going on inside a person's head. Mm-hmm. So the opportunity for judging somebody becomes less when you almost expect them and you hope that they'll bring along a different perspective to what you have, not the same one. Mm. So I, I think it definitely gives the opportunity to 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 embrace variance mm. rather than PLUs, you know, people like us. Now, one other thing I've missed, so let me drag you mm-hmm. into a different conversation as well. Judy, and that's, um, we talked about tasks, we talk about explorations and decision making, and the other thing I do is coaching, mm-hmm. and that could be described as a collaboration, mm-hmm. and that very much is about a void, but in this situation, it's not really about throwing my weight around at all in that. Mm-hmm. I don't get the opportunity to to be much of myself at all in, in a coaching session you know if somebody asked me what they should do about a particular dilemma they face in a in a coaching session i would you know it would be a very open question it's all about them really it's not, there's as little as me as possible in it mm-hmm. because all i'm doing is holding the conversation open and keep keep it flowing and keep it exploring mm-hmm. but really People usually know the solution. Mm-hmm. And the having solution. And, and being a coach sometimes myself, I'm thinking, well, there, that holding the void metaphor is still needed in most coaching. You're there as more than just a cardboard programmer. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and it's just that in the coaching phase, it's much more driven by the other people. Mm-hmm. You're not throwing your weight around to hold that void open because in a coaching session, it's like that would be like you know, flicking the nose of a tortoise, wouldn't it? They'd just mm. duck straight back in and you wouldn't get anywhere. They wouldn't get anywhere, should I say. So in the coaching role, I think it would be much more a listening thing, much more driven by the person exploring alternatives and really helping them I don't even know if that's the right word, really, but just allowing them to lay out all the different options and what and how they view them, mm-hmm. and exploring with them whether some of them make them feel more anxious than others, and perhaps that's why they haven't been pursuing them. Mm-hmm. But really, the idea is to give the person a space themselves rather than um, engineer something for them. If you if you sort of trying to the differential here mm-hmm. between. Absolutely decision making and and coaching was a very different feeling yeah, but there are all types of collaboration mm. and, and i suppose I, I i changed my collaboration style depending on what what um what the other people were hoping to get from it and what i was hoping to get from it brilliant thank you so much for that i'm what, keeping one eye on the clock i'm realizing Good. that one thing i need to say out loud um is is that what you've just said fits so closely to the sort of the philosophy of clean language that quite a lot of the listeners will know about um, that I need to say out loud that as far as I know you had not heard of clean language until the moment before we started this call. No, I thought it was about not swearing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you very much for that. It's 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 absolutely brilliant to hear the same kind of philosophy coming from a completely different place it's it's really important to me to know that there are are co-thinkers out there that clean languages are not on their own and that's one of the things i've been delighted by in working with yourself and others on this whole self-management stuff because you know it's about finding the others finding the people who are thinking thinking interesting thoughts and yet or not people like us 
Absolutely. It, you want different, different thoughts from people like us. Mm, good stuff. So, as we run out of time, um, if people want to contact you about this, um, how can they find you and who would you like to hear from? Um, so, how can they find me? That's easy. Um, Julian at mattblacksystems.com is my email address. Um, and who would I like to contact them? Anybody who's interested in self-management and who, uh, of, you know, business organizations, who wants to see an example of how it can work. It's not, I'm not promoting this is the way, the way we do it is the answer. I'm just saying, if you, if you're interested in it, come and see it working and then go and do something for yourself. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Great, Judy. Bye-bye.